Tonight we're looking at Daniel chapter 26, but we're going to begin in verse 25. Verse 25. And I'll turn there and read that for you. Uh, sorry, Daniel 6, did I say? Yeah, so Daniel 6, verse 25. Sorry about that. It says, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell upon the face of the earth, on, uh, dwell on the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the, uh, unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that this is the second time now that a king, first it was Nebuchadnezzar, has been humbled before God, who has humbled himself in his position. If you look at some of the writings of uh, Darius, and you can find them, uh, he has a lot of, uh, of steles and other things uh, in, in various locations where he would conquer. He, he was really uh, talking about his kingdom a lot. And he, you know, he would talk about himself in high terms. A king of kings, you know, a, one uh, whom his false god had given him rulership over all of this kingdom. And these are the sort of things that he said about Babylon when he... Uh, first was victorious there. But it didn't take God long to humble Darius. A relationship with a man of God started it all. So Darius, his heart was knitted together with Daniel. You know why? Because he was just looking for someone who would be a faithful steward, who, whom he could trust. He found that in Daniel. He found in Daniel the, a right spirit. The spirit of the gods, they said, dwelt in this man. And so Darius found that person that he had been looking for. I love what he says here. He, he of course, makes mention of God, but in the very beginning he says, uh, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. You can tell this is the actual letter. So this is being recorded with the letter, much like uh, Nebuchadnezzar's letter to his realm, uh, talking about God and praising God. Uh, his writings are allowed into the word of God. Peace be multiplied to you. Doesn't sound like a king, does it? Uh, kings are usually gung-ho. You know, the sword is first and all of that. He said, I make a decree. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. This word tremble is a combination of two words. Uh, and it, it means a continual shaking. And of course, when we think of trembling, we think of someone who's afraid that there is fear. And we always think of that in a negative sense, right? That, you know, if, if someone's got a, you know, a knife or something over your head and, and they're threatening to use it, fear would strike you and you would shake. And that's certainly one reason why people would shake. But we forget that with God, it is his presence. It is his, it, it's his being that makes men to tremble. When we see ourselves in the light of who God is, we think of ourselves very small. And so people will tremble at the least little thing. I've seen, I've seen people tremble around movie stars and, and shaking and can't put two words together because it's someone that they saw on a screen somewhere and they just can't, you know, I, I can't believe I'm in their presence. That's that's similar to what I'm talking about. It's a reputation. The reputation of that person and their, you know, I guess their star power, for lack of a better word. 
makes people tremble. But Darius is saying everyone should tremble before God. This is a king. Now, if a king says, I'll tell you what, I'm not afraid of anyone. That's, that's how you rev up your troops. We're not afraid of them. They, they have been brought along here so that we might destroy them. You know, they're nothing to us. You know, be, be strong and a good courage fight. But Darius is saying, here is a God who cannot be overcome. This is the one living God. He said, the living God. I wonder if when he saw God and what he could really do, he thought, all of these others are, are nothing but wooden statues. They're iron and gold and brass and, and, and stone. And they have no power. They're not alive. This God is a living God. A man can ask of him and he will deliver. So in order to, to deliver, you must be alive. Now, God can certainly do that. Interesting too, this word fear, you know, I talked about tremble and, and it's because of the position, who God is, that we tremble. You know, we bow ourselves before him. Remember the Bible says that before Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you and I have already done that. We have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord and it has glorified the Father that we've done it because when we acknowledge the Son, we glorify the Father. But there will be others too, those who, who despised Him, who crucified Him, who, uh, who have believed that He did not exist all of their lives who one day will be required to bow the knee. Remember, there is a judgment. There's a judgment for the children of God uh, to, uh, to judge their works in this world for, for the Lord. What, what they did with all of the benefits that Christ had given them. How did they live their life? That's, that's uh, as we know, the judgment seat of Christ. It's for the allocation of, of uh, rewards. But there's also another judgment at the end of days. Death and hell uh, cough up the, the souls of, of those who are, who are there. And uh, they all come before Jesus Christ. And they all bow the knee. They all give him honor and glory. You are the Lord. And they mean it. They're not just saying it because, you know, they've got a sword over their head. They're, they've already been judged. They're already guilty. But they say to him, you are Lord. And they glorify God in doing it. Even over his enemies, he's going to be glorified. Now, Darius was talking about that kind of fear as well. The word fear here is interesting. It, it has in it the idea of, the, of, the, of slinking. You know how you slink around? You sort of make yourself small so as to not be noticed when you, you're trying to get by with something and you know, you're afraid, oh, I'm coming in too late. My parents might say something, so I'm, you know, I'm gonna sneak around or I'm doing something I shouldn't do. I'm gonna I'll try to hide it and do it surreptitiously. That's this idea of fear. And by implication, of course, it does mean to fear, but I just thought that was an interesting thing. The slink is to, is to be as quiet as you can and not draw attention to yourself. And just, if I can just slip through, you know, I'm afraid if I can just slip through, I can make it. Reminds me of those tension filled parts of movies where, you know, you're uh, the, the, uh, the bad guy is about to get away and he's, he's making the getaway with all of the goods. And the owner of the, of the property is looking for him everywhere. And he's just slinking through and everyone's going, he's there, he's there, get him, you know, there, there he is. But they slink through in fear and they make their way out. The Bible tells us that he is the living God. He didn't say a living God. He said he is the living God. In other words, there are none others. 
And he explained it uh, further by this. He is steadfast forever. Now this word steadfast means permanent. That's the idea behind the word, like the, the base meaning here. And you can see how that would be used to mean steadfast. If something is like the rock of Gibraltar, you know, you could put an anchor in it and you would be okay. As long as your chain could hold, you'd be fine because that the rock is not moving. This is God. In fact, the Bible says he is our rock and our fortress. That talks about the steadfastness of God. We put our anchor in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will we'll not be shaken, will not be, will not be hurt. His kingdom also shall not be destroyed. Now, we know that the Lord said this about his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you remember the church was made up of, firstly, the uh, reaping and the harvest of the nation of Israel. All of those who believed on Jesus Christ during his personal ministry were brought in. Remember the apostles were appointed and there were disciples and there were followers. There was a great, a great host of people at one time. But this was the first, it was the gleaning of the grapes, really. It was the gathering in of the harvest of Israel. And it continued on for several years, but certainly early on, there were thousands of Israelis being saved. They were being brought in left and right, so much that Peter says, you see how many, even among the priests, have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it seemed to him that almost the whole nation of Israel was coming over to Christ. Of course, it wasn't quite uh, that uh, significant, but as many as received him, to them gave he power. This was the beginnings of the church. I love the fact that it started that way. You know, when we think of the church, we think of Gentile, the Gentile age, right? Because we look back to the age of the patriarchs, which was the time really of the nation of Israel, of their, of their prominence as they uh, were, were made a spectacle to other nations as God brought them along, promising his Messiah to come through them. But nevertheless, uh, we're told that uh, in, in the end, God, God made of this nation and of the Gentiles one new whole, the Lord's New Testament church. He, he brought this from this side and this from this side and he put the two together. And he said, there's no more division. And he signified as, as such by uh, tearing down that middle wall of partition between the holy place and the holiest of all. He tore it from top to bottom. Remember, it was rent from top to bottom, opening the way to the holy of holies because Jesus had fulfilled what was required of the Savior of, of the world. So what a wonderful thing that uh, these sorts of thoughts are coming into the mind of Darius. And he says here that um, the, the uh, goodness of God, the, the living nature, his ability to deliver, um, is beyond beyond uh, understanding. He says he delivereth. That is literally to make free. He he makes people who were slaves free men at his will in his time. And that's what he's done. Certainly with us, we were in bondage to sin. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But he's made us free. He's broken the chains that bound us, and now we're free in Christ. We're alive too unto God. He says also that he rescueth, and that means to extricate. And brethren, this is the one we really need to remember. He's going to extricate us. He's going to get you out of every tight situation that you're in. So you're in a tight spot. Daniel was in a tight spot. You're in a tight spot. God's going to extricate you. How's he going to do it? We don't know. But we don't have to know because he's the one doing the extricating. What, what we have to do is just trust in him. That, that he's going to work things out his way and in his time. 
I mentioned to you that not everyone was delivered from every trial. If that were so, everyone would be alive who, who trusted Christ from, from the, the beginning of time until now. There are times when the answer is that we're brought home to be with him. There are times when the answer is we've, we've lived our portion and, and now it's time to come home, right? And there are certainly accidents and, and disease that are the results of sin in this world that, that we account for. We know that these things are, are true. They happen uh, indiscriminately to people. Birth defects, all sorts of things that, that hinder people and shorten lives. But that's not to say God's not extricating these people. It's not to say he's not a mighty God. I think it shows the might of God that these people turn to him. When they're in distress and trial, they, they reach out to him. And he says, don't worry, I, I've got you covered. I've got you in my hand. Nothing's going to happen to you. And that's what he said to you and I. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Nothing's going to happen. That is nothing untoward. It's going to work out just according to his plan. Bible says here, and, and this, these are the words of Cyrus, that, uh, or rather of Darius, that he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in the earth. So he is God of heaven, but he is also God of the earth. He works signs and wonders in both. He, he is a true God. Now, oddly enough, you might find this interesting, you know that when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, quite a few years later after these events, there are synagogues everywhere. Did you know that it was at this time when Israel was in exile, and in the divided Israel and Judah were in exile in uh, Babylon, that they began this thing of synagogues. And there were a great number of believers who converted to Judaism from these nations. And there were synagogues cropping up everywhere. And just like there were synagogues in every town in Israel in Jesus' time. But this is where they had their beginnings. Places of worship, houses of worship. And uh, Darius was wont to do this. If any nation had a God, it, it, when he overcame them, if they were subservient to him, he would donate money. He would build uh, uh, a, a place for them to worship that God. But when he saw the real one true God of heaven, uh, it was at the end of his life. Did you know that? So the events that transpired that night that Belshazzar died, remember I told you they came in the Euphrates River, they came underneath into the city, unknown by the people. They just sprung up on the, the temple there. Before they knew it, someone was knocking at the door. And Belshazzar said, open the doors and find out what this tumult is. And when they opened the doors, the Medes and the Persians, their armies came in, swords drawn, and they killed him. From, from that night, the Bible tells us that Darius was 62 years old when he took over. By age 64, he was dead. Two years. Two years and his life was gone. But what did God do for Darius in that amount of time? God raised this man up. He raised up the Medes and the Persians. Even the king that was to follow him, Cyrus, he raised them up for his purposes, to bring about his purposes with the nation of Israel. But he blessed them for for their obedience, didn't he? He blessed Nebuchadnezzar. He gave him back his sanity and his right mind when he praised God. He punished Belshazzar, who saw all the things that God did to Nebuchadnezzar, but never repented, never turned. And so in the end, his life was required of him. And even then, Daniel said to Belshazzar, you're, you're weighed in the balances and found wanting. If Belshazzar would have only dropped down to his knees right there and said, 
I, I see what you say and I understand. God did all of these things you say to Nebuchadnezzar and I repent. If he would have only repented, but he didn't. And so his life was required that night. And then the next king, Darius, who, who sees God and who sees the representatives of God there in, in Babylon and sees how they work and how they worship and then sees the mighty powers and wonders, says of God, he is the living God of heaven and earth. He says, his dominion shall be even unto the end. Right up until the end of time, his, his dominion will be. He worketh signs and wonders, and he hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And I want to wrap up with verse 28. Verse 28 is good for Daniel. This is his, the blessing to Daniel. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian, because when Darius would give up the ghost, Cyrus would come on the scene. Cyrus is a, is a man named of God in the Bible. Long before his birth, he was named in the Bible that it would be in his days that Israel would return, that he would give the decree to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And that would start uh, the turnaround of their captivity. They would be in captivity 70 years. God told them that through prophecies. And we're, we're gonna see those as we, as we go through the book of Daniel. So it was going to be a long stay, but for all of this, God had a plan for Israel. He had a plan for them. And along the way, he was blessing those who, who would follow him and would hear what he had to say. He was blessing them. He was giving them good examples, just as he is in this world. And uh, we are those good examples. We are the light set on a hill. So the Bible says Daniel, this Daniel prospered in the rain. That word prospered means to advance. So he was advanced. You remember, that's why, how he got into the lion's den. You think if, if you were Daniel, you'd go, look, just, I like where I am and no one's trying to kill me. So just, just leave me where I am, right? I'm, I'm happy there. I don't need to be. But no, Daniel wanted to progress. And I think he wanted it for God because God had shown him the picture of all of these kings, right? He knew what was coming. And he wanted to be a part of that work. He wanted to be a testimony for God. And praise God for Daniels. Praise God for people like Daniel that are strong, that will stand and will be a good example. We talked about a Darius the Mede, 62 when he took over Babylon, died at the age of 64. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a long reign over Babylon, but Cyrus, his successor, was going to have a, a, a long reign. And we're going to be, in time, looking, looking at that as well. So I appreciate everyone's attention tonight. Now, from now on, the book of Daniel becomes really a book of prophecy. And so we're, we're going to be uh, looking in the Old Testament prophecies in the book of Daniel, which have relevance to other prophecies in the Old Testament, but also prophecies in the New, in the New Testament. And uh, I think we're all going to get a blessing out of it. I, I've never studied this book without getting a, a, fresh, a fresh desire to read God's Word. And you get, you get really stirred up about prophecy by reading the book of Daniel, especially when you get to these chapters, uh, chapter 6 on. And uh, God will perhaps open some things up for us that we'll be able to put two and two together with other scriptures. And uh, I hope so, because, you know, the, what are we waiting on? The Bible says that his return is imminent for us, for, for us as, as members of this church and, and saved individuals. That's our whole goal. We're looking for that great day, at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is imminent. That means it could happen at any time. 
There, there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled. There are prophecies that are going to be fulfilled on the earth, but they don't involve us. The Bible says that we will not know tribulation, that great tribulation. And he's going to pour out tribulation on the earth, but he knows how to reserve the godly and to save them from tribulation. And you watch him work. You'll think, oh, it's too late. Tribulation's coming on all of us. It's gonna hit us all. And then boom, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. He's descend into the air and gather us to himself that where he is, we may be also forever, just like he promised those disciples so many years ago in that upper room.